I'd like to introduce uh, Jen Wamble, um, who uh, used to be an AP psychology teacher and technology integration specialist, and now is the program chair for FETC. So let me stop my slides and let me bring up Jen. Jen. Hi, Mitch. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for Hi. that great introduction. So, so how did you move from an AP instructor to a tech specialist or tech integration specialist? Sure. So like many educators, <laughs> I spent a lot of time multitasking and I became a trainer for Intel early in my career and did some technology training around the country um, in their Teach the Future program and then started working with every kind of device or product that I could get my hands on. So I kind of just became the go-to person at my school and then eventually at my district. And for many years, I actually presented at FETC. And when I um, decided to leave the classroom and work on some professional development research, uh, this position was available working with the conference. And so I decided that taking all of my knowledge of the district and working with grants and funding and procurement and training that I could put it all together and help build the greatest ed tech conference we could build. Yeah. And, you know, I saw that something like, what is it, 1,500 different proposals? Yes, we get a lot of proposals every year. We're going to uh, dig into those tonight a little bit and tell you some data about it. But all of those are really essential to how we build the conference. Um, uh -huh. We use a lot of attendee information, a lot of survey data, and we build a conference to meet the needs of real administrators and real educators. And that's really our ultimate goal. So I'm excited tonight that people gave up a, a, an hour of their time. Hopefully, maybe it's Wine Wednesday. All the people who have their cameras covered are enjoying a little uh, <laughs> a wine or dinner. Uh, but I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being with us and, and having a conversation. Um, I love this platform, being able to interact. Uh, my personal favorite PD is face-to-face, -face, but this right. surely seems like the next best thing. Um, I've yeah. already had some great conversations, and I'm looking forward to a great night. Okay. So um, I'm going to get off the stage and bring up your slides, because that's what people are here to, to, to see is you and your slides. Great. So one second. All right, everyone. So feel free. Um, you have control of making it full screen. Um, so hopefully uh, you can see everything. Um, just as a reminder tonight, um, if you're tweeting along with us, there is a, a tweet button at the top of Shindig, but also we're using just hashtag FETC. Or if you have enough characters left over, uh, you can tweet at EdChatInteractive. Uh, today was a special day for me on Twitter. I finally hit the 10,000 tweets today. So, um, so a little ceremonial for me. All right, next. Hopefully you're seeing uh, the slides on the screen. Uh, one thing I wanted to share with everyone that may not realize is that a lot of people think about FETC as a huge conference with lots of content and lots of amazing companies. But one thing I wanted to share was that we really have a set of core beliefs and we work um, every day to, to build a great conference based on these beliefs. And I think that they mirror what a lot of people who are in districts um, and even in ed tech companies are, are doing also. So I think we have a shared mission. Um, everything that we select is based on having impact on student learning. That is always what matters the most. Uh, we also think that professional learning is the engine that drives student performance and improvements in your school. So we look for sessions and we look to share products and information that really will um, engage uh, the audience, administrators, and teachers, and ensure that we're improving student performance. And then also uh, technology. And of course, it is the center point of our conference, but technology provides equity. Technology provides opportunity. Technology is really pivotal um, in what everyone is doing in schools to build a, a global knowledge economy that we've been talking about a lot lately, a modern workforce with skills that are going to take us into the future. And we are always 
future minded at FETC. So we're really looking um, to share technologies that are creating access sharing technologies that are accelerating learning, uh, sharing technologies that turn ideas and imagination into innovation. So that um, focus will really bleed into the classrooms and the schools and the districts. Next. So I have been quoted several times, um, and, and as I just said, my very favorite form of professional development is face-to-face -face learning. I really think that it's crucial for educators and administrators to have conversations about what's happening in their schools and districts um, with other people. And so FETC provides um, a platform for face-to-face -face interaction every January, but we also interact throughout the year. We have an e-newsletter we send out bi-weekly with information to um, everyone um, who participates. We also um, make sure that our face-to-face -face experience is really the very highest quality. And we do that in the review process, number one, by doing blind reviews. So what that means is that when people are reviewing every submission that comes in, um, and we did have over 1,500 this year, they get read by three different professionals who are experts in that field. We don't know your name. We don't know your school. We don't know where you've come from. We don't even know if you're male or female. We don't know your race. We see the title and the description and the session details. And that's how we make decisions. So we're really focusing on content. And the same way you design a rubric in your classroom to be content focused, we do the same thing at FETC. So we really want the best content to share with a very passionate um, ed tech community. And so we do that on purpose. So um, I will say that by providing this very high quality professional development, we have achieved a reputation um, in the field of ed tech conferences for what we're doing and what we're providing that I'm very proud of because I think that there's a lot of noise in ed tech right now. You are probably being inundated in your email inbox from different companies or products or events, uh, mail in actually your teacher mailbox um, with lots of information about who's the best product, the best trainers. Well, at FETC, our goal is to have one-stop shopping. We want people to come to FETC and be able to find the answers that they're looking for. What is the best digital tool for something? What is the company that's providing different solutions? Um, how do we create pedagogy that engages students? Whatever questions or problems or issues you're having on your campus, we want FETC to be the answer. And so the way we do that is by providing the very highest quality professional development. Next. On the next slide, you'll see that there's really three things that I work towards um, our team developing the best program. And these are things that you may be doing in your districts um, and in your states as well. So in order to build the FETC program, I look at three things. The attendees, the participants in the conference, the current ed tech products that are available on the market, and then systems of delivery for professional development. So I'll take each of these one at a time, but there's some guiding questions that I, we think through as a team. Um, we gather lots of survey data and information from attendees from the marketplace um, and do lots of research on different forms of delivery. We look at things like your mobile app when you actually submit an evaluation on sessions that's very valuable to us. We look at information, um, especially surveys and interviews that we do with principals and superintendents and districts to get a real tap on what the needs are. So um, in the first thing I'd like to talk about are attendees and we're really interested in the content topics, which I think many of you are here today. Um, so we want to find out about who the attendees are, what are their needs and what training levels are they at. So on the next slide, um, you'll see that we get um, some feedback on attendees from registration data, right? Um, that's really easy to find. So FETC, this will, we're getting ready for our 37th year. FETC was actually started by some directors of technology uh, from dif different districts that got together in Tampa in 1981 to try to figure out 
how to make technology effective on their schools and in their districts. And every year since, FETC has attracted administrators, IT directors, educators from all over the world. We now represent all 50 states and more than 30 countries at the conference. So people are coming to share what they know, what they do, as well as teach others. So we're really excited. Last year, we had right at 9,100 participants. And of those, here's a little breakdown, because I'm going to come back to this later, of what our audience looks like. Of the people who attended FETC, 33% um, were educators. Those are people in the classroom who are using technology in some facet. 32% of um, our audience are people who are IT directors, CIOs, network administrators, those folks who are working to make sure the infrastructure and network is strong. 24% are administrators and 11% are support staff. So we really value the fact that districts and states send their support staff to get trained as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that hands-on training and how essential it is. On the next slide, what I'd like to let you know is that we have attendees that come from many uh, states and many countries, but we, um, our largest group is from America. So we look a lot at what, what's happening in America education and American education. So this slide is showing you some staffing information. This is important to us because this is a, a combination of charters, uh, private schools, public schools, uh, and we even have at our conference some homeschool administrators and teachers, and we draw from a very large audience. The largest um, out-of-country delegation is Canada, um, but our largest American um, population has been a little bit in, in shift, okay? So although uh, we began as an IT director conference, and then we grew our education um, attendees very much, now we're seeing a shift towards more leadership and IT staff coming to the conference. So we want to meet their needs as well. So when we look at who's coming to the conference and we compare that to how many of each role there are in the country, we can see how we need to position the sessions and align them to different roles in schools and districts. So for example, um, we know here that there's you know, a, around 11,000 superintendents. Um, there are 89,000 principals. And the, but, of course, there are 3.5 million teachers in this country um, doing incredibly valuable work every day. So we need to position our content to be in line with those people who could be attending. So one way to think about this, if you'll uh, direct your attention to the blue box, is that basically right now in America, for every one superintendent, there's about 257 teachers. And we're getting some feedback from superintendents and principals that they're inundated with ed tech information and they need help making choices about what's best to use on their campuses. So for every one principal, there's 40 teachers. So we see um, everyone who comes to the conference as valuable for growing what's happening on your campus and making decisions about technology on your campus. So you did such a great job in the opening with interacting with this platform. Let's try to interact in groups um, and let everybody share a little bit. So I have a question on the slide that said, who makes ed tech decisions at your school or district? Um, and also, who needs ed tech training in your schools and district? You might be interested to hear some of our survey results, but I'd like you to take a minute and um, interact with another person to do that. Mitch, would you come up and remind everyone how to interact on this topic? Okay, sure, Jen. Uh, so this is, again, a time to interact. I see a couple of you are doing this already. You, uh, There's two ways of interacting on this. One is if you have a webcam and microphone, you can click on the avatar of another person and you can do a private talk with that person, or you can open up the IM window and you can type in the answers yourself. Uh, the two questions up here are who makes EdTech decisions, and then 
who need who in your school or district needs ed tech training and for what um, and then if you want to go on to that you could also start talking how are ed tech decisions made and what's your role in making those ed tech decisions and so this would be a time to talk to other people and Jen and I will come back in about two minutes and and do a recap Okay, so let me pull Jen back up also. Okay, did you get a chance to interact with anybody during the session? I was able to, yeah, I was able to uh, see some responses in the IM box as well wow. as overhear some conversations. So, so one um, thing. Yeah, I was going to say, so what, what were some of the things that you observed? Right, so one, uh, several people from big districts said that the decisions were made at the district level, and mm -hmm. some people commented that there were teacher committees that made decisions, and then another person said it was just the principal. Okay, and, and I'm wondering if there's anybody who would like to volunteer to come up and just talk about how those decisions are made in their district. Um, if somebody's willing to talk about that with Jen or has questions about with Jen about how they should be, uh, how those decisions should be made. Uh, maybe you can click on that raise hand button. Uh, raise hand is the hand that kind of looks like this um, beneath your avatar. Or Jen, if you wanted to call on somebody, maybe I could find them. Or we could just move on to the next slide if if that's what people want to do. Well, I can give some some feedback from what we found out from some of our okay. research. And um, I think people are doing a great job having conversations. Um, I will tell, let you know that we did do a survey. And superintendents, of course, let us know that they were the decision maker. Uh, but when we also talked a lot with principals, many principals confided in us that they send teachers to conferences and other places so that they can get their feedback and that a lot, or they'll send department heads to do some research because they wanted the people who were using those tools to actually have some experience with them before they purchased them. So I thought mm -hmm. that was really interesting. So I'm not sure if the leadership everywhere is um, admitting to that. Uh, I have seen some research out um, from some different groups that there's an acknowledgement that teachers have growing in, input in those decisions. Um, yep. But I think ultimately who signs the check, you know, most places as a principal or superintendent um, or IT director. So it's very interesting. I think we are experiencing a little bit of a shift in that. It's very difficult to become an expert in every ed tech field now, in every curriculum area. So so we are seeing a little bit of a shift in that response. Um, yeah, so I think and I'm, I'm seeing also that it that administrators both at the school level and the district level are coming to a much better understanding that it's the teacher who's in front of the students mm -hmm. and so if you don't involve the teachers in the decision then the technology you know you, it, it gets wasted because the teachers aren't going to use it um, because it's it's not um, it's not necessarily what's best for their students uh, exactly. teachers basically know best 
<laughs> there you go. Just like mom. So uh, we have to keep that in mind uh, when we're designing sessions because we have to make sure that we have platforms and sessions available for every level of leadership, every type of decision maker. Um, and we that's a really big part of deciding what we're going to share at the conference. Um, mm -hmm. On the next slide, if we can go back to the slides, yep. uh, there's another thing that we think about that probably you've been introduced to at your schools. Um, this is the innovation adoption curve. Uh, you've probably seen this um, in some other uh, uh, presentations, but I'll tell you that we think about this a lot. Uh, a lot of times the people who come to our conference, I like to refer to them a little bit as the lunatic fringe. They're usually your early adopters. They are um, very gung-ho on technology. They are wanting to make a difference in the lives of students. They are eager to find technologies to assist. Um, but what we hear in the feedback that we get from a lot of surveys of principals and superintendents, they tell us that many of their teachers need to gain basic understanding, that they still need some basic skills um, on operating systems, on software, on device management, uh, even on classroom management and dealing with devices. And so, oh, and especially pedagogical strategies of using technology in the classroom. So when we're making decisions about the conference, we can't just gauge every session to be the greatest, newest emerging technology because that would only serve a very small amount of our audience and, and our participants. So we have to think a lot about even late majority and those laggards out there because many times they are getting sent to a conference in order to learn something and to improve their skills to meet the needs of their professional development plan and to seek improvement. So you're not going to always see at FETC every session or workshop being the most advanced. We have lots of workshops for basic uh, beginners of using technology as well as advanced. And so, you know, we really do think about that. We want to serve everyone at the school level and the district level and to meet their needs. So um, I, sometimes people are, are really interested in why do we pick certain workshops or that looks simplistic. Um, many times things uh, that you might not expect are very popular because people want to gain an understanding, practice hands-on use in an environment where they feel comfortable, learn how to incorporate that in a, in a tool lesson plan um, while they're at the conference and come back to school fresh and with some new knowledge. So you won't always see just advanced or just emerging technology. You're going to also see some of those um, very basic level workshops and sessions as well. And, and that's why. Um, next slide, please. Um, one thing I want to tell you about, and those of you who may have um, put in a submission for FETC this year, is that we did change the way our track system works. For many years, it's been based around content ideas and content areas. Um, and this year, um, some of the feedback we got from attendees said that there's so much to see and so much to do that they have want to make it easier to find what's most important to their role in the school. And also, they want to find the people to connect with. So again, the essence of a face-to-face -face conference is making sure that you're networking and, and making your professional development um, network or learning community grow. So this year, you'll see listed on this slide um, the five tracks that we focused all of our content on. Now, no one session is just for one person, as many of you can imagine. Um, for example, if there's a session on online and blended learning, uh, we'd have administrators who are coming to learn if that's the right thing for their school. We have IT directors coming in to learn about what bandwidth is needed and what network support is needed to do that. We have educators coming in to learn how do I best use blended learning and how do I incorporate that into my curriculum. Um, so a lot of times, many people in different roles will be sharing in lots of the sessions and workshops, but we're hoping uh, we have one goal here in mind next. And that goal is that this year it'll be easier to find people in your learning community and to grow your network of um, community of practice and your network. So we want to help people find their tribe. 
We want um, FETC to be there, the source for ed tech information, a go-to event for everything that they need to know about, and that at the event you can find people with shared um, problems, you can find people who have shared implementations. So we're hoping that by building the tracks around the role, your role at, at your school or district, then you're more likely to be in sessions that you can engage in conversations just like you are doing this evening um, and get to know more people and that those relationships that are made and that network post event will help guide the things that you're trying to solve on your campus. Uh, next please. All right, so just um, a quick stat here about some of the submissions this year. So as we break it down by track, uh, you'll notice that about half of all the submissions were in the educator track. Now, most of those were submissions dealing with a technology, and many of them were dealing with a particular digital tool. So they were focusing um, on one of those things that they'd like to share with educators. Um, 12% were IT that and the administrator. So those two are in purple because those are our areas of growth. We saw a large increase in the number and quality of the submissions for IT directors and, and the IT community as well as administrators this year. So you'll notice when you see our full uh, conference schedule, there are in fact more sessions for both of those audiences since they're growing. So we uh, looked at the tracks. And we also looked, I put over here on the right again, our population of attendees from last year, and we compare those. Now, I will uh, point out uh, that special education uh, has its own hands-on lab. Again, this year we're really excited about. And it also has um, a special room and set of workshops for those learning about assistive technology in that growing field. But we did add a new track this year. We've added an entirely new track on early learning. This is an area of growth that many of you might have seen the emergence of lots of incredible uh, technology for young learners. Um, these are people who are working with ages three to eight. And these are technologies that are being used appropriately uh, with students to encourage learning in different ways. Some of them look really cool. I know the uh, Fisher Price Caterpillar is now teaching coding. So some of those things that you might be seeing on the market, well, uh, we're going to be able in this track to discuss what's appropriate, when it's appropriate, how much screen time is appropriate. And so lots of schools have pre-K programs now. So this new track is targeted at our pre-K directors and pre-K teachers um, so that they have a platform for discussing the use of technology with young learners. So we're really excited about early childhood joining us at the conference this year um, and the growth of the special ed workshops. And we will see, um, and you'll see in the, in the program in a minute, lots more sessions on information technology and administrators. Um, maybe not all of them want to admit it, but a lot of our administrators are really interested in getting training and being up on the, on the latest technology that's being brought to their schools um, so that they can engage in those conversations and utilizing those tools uh, as well to, to manage their schools. All right, so next slide, please. Uh, this little quirk is uh, is just for you, um, a few little facts that I think are interesting. Uh, the Wordle here, I took um, several pages, actually, um, if you took every submission in 8 point font with half inch margins, it ends up being 295 pages of descriptions. Um, and basically I made those into a Wordle. So I think it's interesting to see that the words that are used in ed tech um, obviously are the larger ones on this word cloud. Um, I'm very proud that students are, came up as the center. That was uh, completely lucky. But that we're keeping our focus on the students. We're keeping our focus on learning. Um, but you can see those words were read a lot of times. <laughs> and, um, and so that's interesting. Um, I will tell you we had presenters submit um, from 37 states and 12 countries. Um, that's really interesting um, and the international feedback is terrific and we encourage you know many of those. I will tell you that of most of our out-of-country participants they're almost all administrators or um, an IT director 
uh, in nature, and they're coming to learn from what's happening in the American school system. So it's very exciting that um, that's happening. I also wanted to share with you that most people submit um, between one and 37 applications. We did have one person submit 37 different applications to submit. So, so uh, I would probably guesstimate the average is probably two. Um, lots of people just try to want to be a co-presenter, some want to present, but uh, I think that's interesting. Um, as we go to the next slide, I'll also share with you the most popular states that speakers submit from are North Carolina, New York, Iowa, and New Jersey. So um, I think that's really interesting that uh, across the nation people are looking to come to FETC. Um, so we've already talked about attendees, but now let's talk about one of my favorite things, and that's EdTech products. So there's lots of ways we can track trends on what's happening in the field of ed tech. Some of you might have been following TechCrunch last week and, and their Disrupt conference. Uh, some of you might be following angel investors and seeing where they're um, putting their investments towards education. Uh, some of you might be following product announcements. So on the next slide, I wanted to share with you um, how we keep up with what's happening um, in education technology. Uh, it is a massive field. It is, you know, education is 9% of the American GDP. So it is a large part of our economy. And there are lots of amazing businesses that are doing great things to improve education. One thing uh, we always caution ourselves about is watching out for the buzzwords and the excitement of emerging technology and then the reality. So we do survey um, many folks at the school districts. Um, to find out what is their reality. Now, most of the leadership is telling us through surveys that their biggest concern right now is either trying to go one-to-one -one or BYOD, that really getting bandwidth and equitable access to devices is the number one priority in many places. We see some amazing examples from across the country where entire schools and districts are already there and that's incredibly promising. I wish my own district was there, but they're not. So there's a lot of leadership who are struggling with still getting that bandwidth that's needed, getting the devices in the hands of their students, and working towards a goal of incorporating more technology on their campuses. So we have to keep that reality in mind. Even though the tech world is buzzing around about cloud computing and mobile tools, the Internet of Things, convergence, adaptive learning, and a lot of really exciting things we have to offer at our conference both the realistic training that's needed and share some experiences there, and then also the future of what's ahead and the emergent technologies. So kind of keep that in your mind. Um, we do also hear back from our leadership surveys that most leadership want to hear successful stories. They want to see schools that have successfully implemented BYD or one-to-one. -one. They want to see how those teachers got engaged with the tools. They want to find out how they did the professional development embedded in the workday. They want to learn more about how it was all budgeted and paid for. So procurement issues. So we really work hard to provide those type of leadership topics based on the feedback we're getting from them as well. Um, next slide, please. You all are probably um, well aware of this with your own content areas, but the really the way to keep up with great content and to build great content in your conference is just constant research. And I myself and our team are constantly researching and reading as much as we can. Uh, so I'm sharing here um, some of the things that we use on a daily basis. Um, but this is a really exciting time in education technology and the education industry as a whole. There's a lot of changes happening. Uh, I think we've all used the word transformation a lot lately. But uh, Silicon Valley and some of their brightest minds are working hard to come up with some solutions for education. Some things that are really going to change the way teachers interact with students. We we're already seeing that recently with um, different mobile tools and also the way we remediate students, the way we engage students, more game-based learning theory built into a lot of our uh, virtual programs. 
Um, and so that excitement in the education technology community is going to really bleed into um, what we're doing in the classrooms in the districts. So what I've seen um, and what I'm constantly following every day, and um, I'd love to follow all of you all as well, is we follow a lot of the major research reports. Um, many of you probably just read New Media Consortium's report that just came out recently. Um, Julie Evans and the Project Tomorrow data is phenomenal in keeping up with that reality piece, what's really happening in school, what do districts and teachers and students really think about what's happening. Um, our partners at COSIN and CETA produce lots of great research and studies um, that really help gauge the direction and the trends that are happening um, right now in ed tech. So lots of places, lots of journals, lots of research groups. Um, and also, you know, we do fun things following TED Talks and other startup events to see what's happening and how that entrepreneurial spirit is going to really bleed into the classrooms. And we're really excited to see some of those changes that are coming forward. We do have a very uh, amazing advisory board of experts who also make recommendations to us. And those people are listed on our website if you're ever interested because they're, they're great to reach out to and, and to get information from. Um, real quickly, I wanted to give you all a chance to uh, not hear me talk anymore. But why don't you find someone else, uh, click on the picture of someone else to talk to, um, and share with them where you find um, your latest trend research or, or where you find the latest information to use. Is it at a PD training? Is it online? Is it through a special group? But how about you type in the IM box or click on someone's picture and share how you find uh, great information. And if you want to do that, let's do that for about two minutes. Mitch, if you want to pull me down. Okay, so um, I'm going to bring Jen back up here, and uh, you know while you were well while people were doing this, I was kind of thinking of some of the things that um, that I use to keep up with it. Of course, I use Twitter a lot, and I um, 
I really follow the, the two hashtags, EdChat and EdTech. Uh, there's always interesting things coming with those transoms. Um, and interesting, uh, interestingly enough, there's a lot of, of good EdTech happening on Facebook. There are, there are some really interesting um, education groups, and you can just search for the education groups on Facebook. And I get a lot of information through those. And then uh, I get a, I get a lot of newsletters, but one of the ones that I kind of I, I always try to glance at is ASCD publishes a newsletter called Smart Briefs, and uh, daily that you know, you see about five or six articles. Um, one or two of them are, are always seem to be of interest. So those are some of the ones that that I that I follow to get information. What are some of the things that you saw when you talked to people? We got a lot of feedback from social media, a lot of Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, I spoke to two people who um, also get several journals that actually subscribe to printed journals that come to the school and that they have a technology committee that shares with their staff uh, regularly. Oh, great idea. Mm -hmm. so, so I thought that was a really good idea too. It's very difficult to stay up. I mean, just like we're listing here, there's only so much time in every day. So the more we share, that's why I, I like you. I, I really enjoy Twitter because I can get the resources from other you know, valued people who have the same interests and not have to curate all of it every single day. So you know, and, and what I was thinking is that hopefully some of the people here can make longer term connections and start their own professional learning network with some of the people that they meet either on these sessions or at FETC or at other things that they go to. That they go exactly. To. Exactly. 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 Um, once we uh, kind of go back to the slides, uh, I want to point I'll out do that, that now. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks. Um, that a lot of um, marketplace research happens uh, here in the office, and that helps to make some decisions about what we should be sharing at FETC, what products are ready for the school system, what products are available, attending user conferences. On the next slide, um, you'll just see some pictures of things that, you know, we've been uh, milling over this year and, and we'll definitely have serious workshops at FETC. Um, with the emergence of uh, virtual reality, um, we've gotten uh, done a lot of research about what's really ready for the classroom. Um, I've been really following that. I also think uh, Kathy Strzok has shared some really great resources in the FETC hashtag um, that she's developed. Um, so we're working with Samsung to develop some workshops where they're going to bring Gear VR to the workshops and teach people what the steps are to using VR in the classroom and how to do it and actually practice it and design lessons. So we actually work with a lot of companies to create content that's just in time, that's ready for educators so they could go back to the classroom and use the technology or know what resources are needed to get started. Um, you'll see here, you might not recognize this one item. It's actually a 3D printer there from Form Labs. Uh, they are in the 3D printing business and really specializing in what's happening in schools. And they're also um, this year designing some content to share about how to use 3D printers at, in, in the workshops. Uh, participants will actually get to do a project. They'll create a product. They'll know start to finish what is needed to have 3D printing in their schools. So even though we may be offering basic uh, workshops on uh, Word and uh, iPad apps and things of that nature in the basic function, we have some pretty high level hands on workshops that we develop with our partners in the industry because they are the best people to train on how to use these products. Um, last year, Little Bits and Legos, uh, many of these um, products from uh, Autodesk Instructables, those were popular items at the event, so we make sure and include those as well. Um, so we're looking this year um, at some of the trends in coding, obviously here Maker, virtual field trips and um, VR and the technologies that inspire students are what we really want to provide at the conference. Uh, next slide shows a list. So this might be interesting to many of you who may have applied this year or applied in the past. These are the most common topics of the submissions that we received. So I took all of the submissions this year and categorized them into some categories. Um, to see which topics were most popular. 
So since these are items that people are willing to talk about and have produced sessions that they want to share, I thought that these are really important topics to look at at the conference as a whole. Um, I did put a number one there by digital tools because we do get the absolute most submissions about how to use various digital tools. And before the conference this year, I'm actually going to publish some lists of what those tools are and what tools you'll be able to learn at the conference because it's really exciting to see people wanting to share how to use things and what's successful in their classrooms. Um, I also wanted to point out some things um, on this list as well. It, anything having to do with personalized learning, uh, that was another large category. Mobile learning, assistive device and special education technology, especially differentiation, uh, we saw lots of submissions on. So I think this is a pretty interesting um, list and it helps guide uh, what we're going to select for the event. I will tell you that there are sessions on every single one of these this year. Um, actually, several of these topics have an entire room dedicated to them. So personalized learning, maker ed, leadership, there's an entire room dedicated um, with sessions and workshops on that topic. We uh, feel strongly that those are things that the education technology market is looking for, that schools and districts are looking for training in. And I'm really excited about a new sessions this year on learning space design. Uh, those are added early learning technology. Those are added this year. And I was very excited to see uh, we are a partner with Future Ready and the US um, DOE. Uh, but there was a lot of submissions this year about how to become Future Ready, how to act as a Future Ready school and district. So there's an entire room dedicated to Future Ready topics. I'm very excited about the districts that have taken that pledge and really helping share that professional development. Um, on the next slide, uh, I wanted to show you that as much as we're looking at what's happening now and the reality of the classrooms now, we do look a lot at future trends. We are the Future of Education Technology Conference, and we do want to constantly be looking ahead to what technologies will be coming into the classroom. Um, this is a great uh, chart from Gardner uh, from last year that we've been watching, and you can see here that virtual reality has actually gotten to a place in the market as well as 3D printing uh, where they are already starting to be um, productive in schools um, and in learning environments. Um, some schools are not there yet. They might have one or two. But this shows us over time uh, how popular these technologies are going to become, um, how much they're going to be embraced. And so we start to kind of look and see where they are. Um, I personally think AR is probably a little further ahead here than a VR, just because it's been easier to use those mobile apps in many education situations. Um, but if you look all the way back to the very beginning, I have to point out one thing that I think is pretty interesting. Um, Ten years down the road, of course, but something called Smart Dust. So I encourage you to um, always be looking at some of these uh, emerging technologies. They're very interesting. Lots of them are in metacognition and cognitive uh, brain science, but smart dust is something that would be able to look like a small piece of dust in your classroom, but be able to gather data about how many people are in the room, the temperature of the room. It, uh, it's a form of data collection um, in the future. So uh, we are always looking ahead to, to what's next in education so that we make sure we have our finger on the pulse and that we are providing a taste of the future of technology so that people can be preparing their schools and districts for what's ahead. All right, next slide. There's some really exciting things that you all uh, may be witnessing at your school, uh, maybe not. Um, uh, in the top right here, biometrics are starting to expand in school uh, a lot. You know, campuses are using technology in many ways, not, not just in the classroom. It improves the efficiency of campus. It improves teaching. There's a lot of times where um, we're using them in a learning environment, but there's also other things on campus that we're using technology for. We're hearing more about uh, wearables and what that's going to and what impact that's going to have um, in education. <clears throat> Just imagine uh, screens that don't break uh, being a part of your uh, technology portfolio, tables that talk. Uh, drones that gather data about students, 
wearables that take attendance. Uh, biometrics are currently being used in cafeteria to pay cafeteria accounts. Um, you know, there's different ways that doors and security systems are interacting. Uh, with humans right now, and how we power our schools and, and store our data on our campuses. All of those things and all of those technologies are essential um, to looking forward. So AI might be a little forward thinking for some campuses, but we need to have that all in the back of our mind and know where we're going. So ultimately, some of these technologies will be adopted adopted um, others might not be um, but they are solving real district and school problems so we look at all forms of technology um, and we need all of that infrastructure and every all those bits and programming and and bandwidth to make all these things successful uh, on the next slide you'll see that we know we don't have all the answers and not all submissions have all the answers when there are topics that we see that are really engaging and that folks are, are really interested in, we reach out to many of our partners and we look to schools who are using emergent technologies, who are using pedagogy in ways that's improving student learning and making them productive, creative citizens. Um, so these are just some examples of uh, groups that present at FETC um, as as keynotes and workshops and sessions that we can all learn from so and we can take away some of the great things that they're doing and, le and learn from their examples I think that's how real transformation happens is when you're seeing other people do it so we often invite schools um, who are doing great work and invite companies who have great uh, innovations and solutions to present so not everybody um, actually turns in a submission. There are some that we reach out to. Um, next, please. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just mention here is that there are, are submissions that are selected for different kinds of sessions, but there's also content that we share on the exhibit hall. And that's really important. Uh, a lot of the companies that come to FETC share updates and build relationships with schools. They actually do hands-on skill training in their booths um, so people who have that their technology or are interested in it can learn so um, I actually think of the expo hall as kind of the second classroom of FETC there's so much to learn on on the expo hall floor um, there are also theaters down there uh, where you can learn about how to use products you can learn about different stem um, solutions. You can also uh, learn at these different stages about startups that are coming and joining. Um, so we definitely don't want to, to miss that. All right, so this next slide will look familiar. We've talked about attendees, we talked about products. Um, and finally, really fast, um, I was going to talk about delivery. Um, we think a lot about what the, how people learn at FETC. And you might be surprised about what people prefer. So as much as we talk about interactivity and being engaged in a lot of workshops and learning experiences, um, we find what people like sometimes is different. People like concurrent sessions. It gives them a lot of choice. Um, people like the keynotes. It gives them big themes and ideas. Uh, there's a growing group. If you'll go to the next slide, I, this is some interesting um, data I wanted to share with everyone. Um, this is actually comparing the number of submissions that we get um, by the applicants. So these, uh, the most people want to do a concurrent se session. The second most amount of people want to do a keynote. The third most workshop, et cetera, et cetera, when they are applying. However, when we ask attendees what they would like to attend and what they learn most from, we get a different list. Um, they say that they learn the most from concurrent and then the second one and I put a star here poster sessions um, a lot of times people may be hesitant to engage in a poster session but what the feedback shows us is that they're getting one-to-one face-to-face interaction with another person who's typically already used a digital tool or done an implementation that they can learn from and again it's networking so they're making connections that last an entire year. They're continuing to move on with finding a solution and, and moving on. The third most popular by our attendees are skill builder sessions. So we actually host those on the expo floor in a theater called Skill Builders, and they're 20-minute how-to sessions. How to use a GoPro in your class. 
how to change the font on a PowerPoint, how to. They're all quick how to, um, kind of like our old fashioned make and take, some of you might remember. But what we're getting feedback from attendees is that they like to attend things where they learn something they can take back, make a connection, and build a relationship. So we put a lot of effort into selecting um, those as well. Um, uh, I, I do want to say what was interesting, some uh, buddy on one of the surveys, I took their quote about posters, and they said, don't underestimate the power of posters. Um, their w vision without execution is a hallucination, said Thomas Edison. So people learn how to execute ed tech projects at their school through having those one-to-one -one conversations. So, I'm really proud that our attendees give us this feedback. And finally, on the next slide, um, you we have already posted uh, 207 concurrent sessions and 168 workshops. They're already online. They were accepted in the first round. Um, the second round is about to go out very shortly here. Um, we're going to be accepting posters, so skill builder how-to sessions, STEM presentations, and, and some more sessions and workshops to come. So there's some details. We There's a speaker page on the FETC website that there's a timeline with acceptances and how that all happens. So you can get more information there. Um, but this, it is an ongoing process. Um, and it'll be completed in October. Um, but we do use all of that, that data real importantly. On the next slide, I just want to take a second. We're, I know we're a little over. But thank you very much um, for participating tonight. Um, continue please this conversation I'm very interested as you can tell in what professional development people are looking for uh, what types of training they're most interested in participating in what the trends and technology are and how we should be sharing those um, so engage with us year-round in the FETC community um, FETC like any school or district has a continuous improvement cycle we are constantly improving the conference constantly making sure we have the best uh, companies represented, the best speakers available, uh, and the latest information in educational technology, your one-stop source. So I definitely want you to um, uh, be able to know that you can share this presentation and you'll be able to access it again. Um, on Friday, I believe, or Saturday, they will go ahead and post both the recording and these PowerPoint slides. They'll be available for you to download and share. Um, and so uh, you can feel free to do that if you miss any part. And then on the next slide, we this, I am just the beginning of this whole EdChat series. Um, FETC is going to feature over the next few months several of our featured speakers to discuss topics that they'll be bringing to FETC. These are the hottest trending topics that are happening in districts around the country. Um, and this is a way to engage in conversations with your colleagues about these topics. So I encourage you um, to sign up for future um, Ed Chat interactives. And now that you know the platform and it's lots of fun, uh, we can do that. And then finally, just as a reminder, um, to use the code when you register so you can get the discount and uh, make sure that to come to FETC and enjoy. And please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or email. And I want to say a special thank you to Mitch tonight. This is an amazing platform, uh, really terrific to interact with everyone. And thanks for giving me your time. I know how precious it is. So, Jen, well, well thank you. Thank you. It, it really gave us a uh, feel, at least gave me a feel, of the tremendous amount of work that goes into putting FETC on and, and the way you really think about the, the technology and the presentations. There, were, there was um, just two questions that, that came in from the field, which I thought were really interesting questions. Uh, one is, um, you know, could, what would you advise somebody in terms of preparing to present next, next year for FETC? Oh, that, that is a good question. So, um, one thing... It wasn't for me. It was... It was um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't claim it, but... I don't know, Mitch. I might work with you. No. Um, one thing to think about is we are looking for well-written uh, descriptions. That's one thing. You would be surprised. Um, but definitely the well-written descriptions that clearly tell what a participant would learn and walk away with. You know, we really want someone not just to share their story, but to be able to convey to the other participants, 
here's what I did, but here's what you're going to learn, and here's what you're going to leave with some knowledge that you can then go back and make a difference in your school and district. And we do always tie that to student achievement. We are looking in those um, applications of how did this improve. It isn't just always student achievement. Sometimes it's teacher collaboration. Sometimes it's leadership management skills. But there's an improvement on a campus that made a difference. And so we're, it's not always the longest submission or the shortest. You know, there's no perfect uh, rubric for that. But we are looking for those key things. It, did it really make a difference? And can the person in the session walk away with some knowledge they can implement right away? Perfect. OK. And then another interesting question came from Gail. Um, just wondering, you know, workshops were at the bottom of the list for in terms for attendees, I guess, in terms of what they learned from. Could that be because there's an additional fee for them, or was there some? Do you think there was another reason? No, I think you're exactly right, and and Gail uh, nailed that one. So when we uh, survey all of our attendees, not all of them attend workshops because they do have an additional fee required. Now, some schools and districts allow uh, teachers to go to up to so many uh, different workshops. So there are different types of registration packages that can be selected. One is unlimited. You can go to up to 12 different workshops um, if you select that registration package. And, and some people just uh, select the, re uh, the full registration, the regular registration, so that they can spend more time in the exhibit hall or they can spend more time doing other things. So I do believe the reason that's lower on the attendee list is because not as many people actually attended. So the numerical number was lower. Um, mm -hmm. But as we look at the feedback from the individual workshops, we get phenomenal response that, that a lot of times one workshop was worth the entire trip. Um, mm -hmm. Many times they're focused, they're hands-on. Uh, the trainers that are selected for those workshops uh, have spoken before at different conferences, they're experienced, many of them are professional trainers. And so um, there are uh, very high quality hands-on opportunities and that are extended. They're two and a half hours long. So the people learn more skills that they can implement. And I think they leave with a little more confidence in their technology skills and confidence that they can implement what they've learned. So the feedback from the workshops is, is definitely the highest. Um, but I think it's lowest on that list because they're for pay. Okay. Well, so um, I'd like to, I'd like you to join me uh, for in a for a glass of wine. Okay. Oh, I'm so jealous. So. Oh, I just have my water cup. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, then afterwards, um, and I wanted to thank you very much, and uh, we'll 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 see you on some of the other FETC events, and I'm sure you and I will be talking anon. Any in any case, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you, Mitch, and thank you everyone for attending. It was really nice, and hopefully we'll all connect in the future. Hopefully, I'll Good. see you all at FETC in January. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, so this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive, and uh, want to thank you all for coming, and hope to see you at a future event. Take care.